Okay, uh, we're going to finish up forms today, and we might get into something else, or we might not. Might save it until Thursday. We'll have to see how it goes. So let me bring up where we left off last Tuesday. And if I'm not mistaken, we just had a couple more things to go as far as forms. Uh, but then we had to talk a little bit about styling and a few other aspects of those. So we'll go ahead and we will um, do that. So just to review, forms allow the user to send information to the server for the server to process it. What does that mean? That means that most websites these days are not just static, plain old HTML pages that look the same every time. You know, great example would be Canvas. My page looks like this because I teach these classes. If a different instructor were to log on, it would look different for them. If a student were to log on, it would look different for them. It all depends. It's customized to you and you alone. Now, that doesn't mean that there are separate HTML files, an HTML file for me, an HTML file for you, an HTML file for the other faculty members. There is instead a script, and a script is a program, and a program's job is to write HTML. So that's why, again, you need to know HTML even if you're going to use one of these other scripting languages like PHP or ASP.NET or whatever. So there's a program that creates the HTML and it creates it based on a number of different parameters and included in that is information that the user supplies on a form. So when I logged on, I gave my username and password. From that, it was able to look up in a database and determine, first of all, that my user ID and password were valid, and secondly, go out to the database and pull the list of classes that I teach, and then create the HTML page. These are called dynamic web pages, and it requires more work on the server, but it can give a much better experience. So, for example, on Facebook, you go log into Facebook, you see your friends and your friends' feed. You do a Google uh, search and you search for a particular term. You see pages related to your particular term. And even more than that, you see pages, if there's a location that's relevant, um, you see pages that take into account your location. So these server-side scripts can get information from a number of places, but one of the main places it gets it from are forms. So, we're going to study HTML forms. We are not going to do server-side scripting. For your assignment, you have to submit to a script that I have written. Um, let's pull up where we left off last time and go in and continue. So we went over this form first. And this form was to do a search with the Bing search engine. And we put in a term that we are searching for and click search. And we get a list of pages that are relevant. If we put in something that is location dependent, such as Italian restaurants, it actually takes our location into account as well. And we're not seeing it on the screen. So it shows us a list of restaurants that are in the general area. So it takes our input and it takes other factors and it dynamically creates a web page on the fly for us. The key pieces of this 
we look at a form, There's a form tag, which goes around the list of fields that we're going to send to the server. In this case, there's only one field. There is a method on the form tag, which says how the data is going to be sent. Get means it's going to be sent via the query string. There's an action, which corresponds to the script that's going to be processing the data. In our case, it's the address of the Bing search script. Then finally, we have form elements contained in, the, in here, and we have to name them in a manner in which the script is expecting. And I noticed by doing a little poking around in reverse engineering that this script expects the term we're searching for to have a name of Q. So that's why I gave my text box the name of Q. Input type equals text will give me a text box. Input type equals submit will give me a submit button. A submit button is a button that you press and it sends the data to the server. All right. We then progress to this page, which is like a little mini college application. And we had a number of different fields here. And you use different fields to um, designate um, how do I want to say this? You use different field types depending on the kind of data and whether you want to restrict the kind of data to certain possible values. For example, student name, that could be anything, right? So that's a free form text field. Your user can type in anything they want to in there. U.S. citizen, however, is a yes or no question. Are you a U.S. citizen, yes or no? All right. Um, there's not a yes, no, or maybe. We don't want to make it true and false. We don't want to make it Y and N. We want to limit this to a particular value. So therefore, we use a checkbox. Checkbox has two states. It can be checked or it can be not checked. All right? State's another example where we don't want it to be free form because one person could type in Alabama, another person could type in AL, another person could type in ALA, Another person could misspell Alabama, all right? Maybe typo and switch the A and the M or something like that, all right? So we give the user a list of predefined choices and they have to pick from one of them. That helps us to make sure that the data that we get is clean and good, all right? Finally, we have what's called the text area, which allows the user to type in multiple lines. So things like, comments or a description or something like that uh, is bound to be in a text area because you don't you want to allow for more than one line. The question of here, why do you want to apply to our college? We want the user to be able to type in as many lines as they want. All right. So let's look at the code to do that, and then let's add, a, let's add a few more things to our different kinds of form controls. All right. I don't have any action on this because there's no server-side script to process this, so I just left the action blank, but I did, did, did give a method of get. There's no action supplied, the form sends the data back to itself, which is sometimes useful in PHP. I have an input, type equals text for the student name. Again, type equals text is a single line of text. Notice I've given it an ID and a name. They both serve different roles, all right? The ID is what we use to attach a label to the input tag. So, the ID connects this text field with this ID so that someone with a screen reader that's navigating through the page using the tab key and can't visually tell what field they're in, the screen reader can read them the label tag that corresponds to this ID. Now, 
We also have a name attribute on that input tag. And that is because when we send the data to the server, there needs to be a name attribute. So you will have names and IDs associated typically with each form field. So that is a text box. A checkbox is similar with the exception of instead of type equals text, we have type equals checkbox. We give it an ID and a name, just like we do with the, um, with the, with the, um, with the text box. And we give it a value. The value is the value that that field is going to have if it's checked. So it'll have a Y if it's checked. So the script will know that if that button is checked, that the value is Y. We have a drop-down. And a drop-down is the first example of something other than an input tag. We don't have an input tag in the case of a drop-down. We still have a label. That label connects via the ID to the drop-down. But instead we have a select tag. And within that select tag we have a set of options. So our drop-down has three options. Option one is Alabama, option two is Ohio, option three is Pennsylvania. Again, you know, you probably would have all 50 of those states if we were doing this. Now, by default, only one is allowed to be selected. You can actually change a drop-down to allow multiple selections, but that's rarely done. All right? And in this case, it wouldn't make sense. You know, you're from one state. You know, you're not from two states. Whatever your mailing address says. Notice that each option has a value and has some text between the option tag, between the start and end option tag. This, uh, this is to accommodate the fact that the script may need the data in one form where the user may understand the data in another form. So for example, in this hypothetical situation, my script needs the state abbreviation, the two character code. But I want to display the complete name of the state for the user to see. Another example of this would be if you had a drop down of products. Let's say you had a page where the user was ordering products. You might want to put the description of the product within the option tag between the start and end option so that the user knew that the one was a you know long sleeve sweatshirt and the other was a hooded sweatshirt and so on. Whereas the value of the option might be something like the product number. Something that wouldn't necessarily make sense to the user. Like does the user know that product XY597 means a short sleeve t-shirt? You know, probably not. So we put a descriptive term between the option tag and we put a value on that. Text area, which I forgot to put the closing tag for, is for multiple lines. By the way, with a dropdown, a dropdown always has a selection. If you don't specify a selection, and you can do that, you can specify default by putting selected here. So for example, if this was an application for Lorain County Community College, I might assume that most people coming that were interested in the college would be from Ohio. So I could put and make the default Ohio by putting selected here. If there is no default, <coughs> I can make a dummy field that says Please select the state where you live. And the top one is then going to be selected. So if you don't specify otherwise, the top one applies. When I ran this before, let's see if I still have it open. I didn't save it, so I'll open it. Oh, here, here we go. Notice that Alabama is the selected option. Why? Because it was the top item on the list. 
Now, that might not be a good default unless most of your customers really are coming from Alabama, right? Because they're liable to not select that and you get all these people lumped in Alabama when they really don't live there. That's why a lot of times you'll put a dummy selection as sort of the top one and in that way You get that message, please select the state in which you live. Finally, we have our text area, which allows for multiple lines. And then we have a submit button. And the submit button is what sends it to the server. Let's add a couple more things to this. One of the things that we need to add is a radio button. Now, when do you use a radio button versus a drop down? You could probably, in most cases, use either of them. But the idea is, is, is typically a radio button is used when there are a limited number of choices, where a drop down might be used when there's a bunch of choices. So for example, if I did all the states, it'd be 50 options for state. I wouldn't want there to be 50 radio buttons on my page. That would clutter the page up too much. So I'll make a radio button for something. radio button looks like this and put type equals radio name equals school and then ID equals in this case we'll say school junior because we want this label associated with this particular button so that people accessing this that are visually impaired will know that they choose this, it will, you know, it's associated with this label. So I'm going to make just three choices, high school junior, high school senior, and other. For our little interest page. Label for junior, junior, radio, okay, high school, label for that, senior, school, ID equals that. Now notice, each of the buttons has its own ID, but they all have the same name. All right, that's key. Remember the rules of an ID. Every ID should be unique. That is, there should not be more than one thing on the page that has the same ID. All right?
The name, however, is what makes it act like a radio button. And how do radio buttons act? They're mutually exclusive. So if I click one, it turns the other ones off. If I gave them each their own name, all right, then I could click the one on, but I could never go and click it off because there's nothing else to click it to turn it off. So let's go and save this and see what I mean. High school junior, high school senior, other. I select other. Then I select high school junior. By doing that, then, notice it unselected other. If I pick high school senior, it unselects junior. So by giving them all the same name, that's what makes them mutually exclusive. All right? High school junior, high school senior, and other. If I were to mess up, and give them all the same, a different name. Or let's say I give this one a different name. Then I'd be able to select that and that one, which is not how a radio button should act. So it's the name that ties them together. All right? I also would not use a name, I also would not use a radio button for a yes or no question unless I had two radio buttons. You're never going to have one radio button in a group. This one radio button's in a group. I can't uncheck it to, by checking on something else. So you're never going to have a radio button where there's only one in the group. If it's a yes or no question, then you have a yes radio button and a no radio button. So I can remedy this by simply going back and making all of these again have the same name. All right. Now, I want to cover three more things with regarding form. There are a couple more form fields that we're not really going to talk about, at least not now. There's a password form field. You do input type equals password. And when you type in then, it doesn't show the characters. So that's why, like, if you notice, instead of if you go to log in somewhere, when you type in your password, it shows dots as a security measure. That's input type equals password. There are buttons that are not submit buttons that I can use to trigger some JavaScript. We'll talk about that later on when we talk about JavaScript. There are clear buttons which wipe out a form and reset everything back to the default value. We're not going to talk about those because those are generally a bad idea to use. All right, Because a lot of times what happens is people get confused and click the clear button instead of the submit button and instead of sending the data, they wipe out all their data and they have to re-enter it. So we're going to avoid the clear button. There's also something called a hidden form field which is used in some more advanced server-side applications to pass some data around. So certainly for the pizza example, if you haven't finished it already, you could get by with just these form controls. But now we're going to talk a little bit about organizing and changing the appearance of forms. All right. So we're going to style it a little bit, and we are going to do what? Oh, we're going to explore some um, HTML5 new controls. All right. One thing that we can do is we can group together form elements because if you look, these three fields are sort of general information. These two fields are sort of um, information about the person's academic history. Sometimes it's useful to group fields together. A lot of times you'll see that, like if you're ordering something online, there'll be a billing address and a shipping address. All right, I want to bill, you know, my billing address or my credit card is is such and such, but maybe I want it shipped, uh, shipped to my office. So I put my office as the, the shipping address. So what's useful sometimes is to group fields together, and those fields are grouped together through the use of a field set command. 
So what I can do is this. I can actually break this down into two lists. And I can put each one of them in its separate field set. Now you don't have to use field sets, but it's a nice thing that you can do and it's good for styling reasons as well as accessibility reasons. So when I put in a field set, I get something that looks like this. I get those lines going around it. All right. And I can do a little bit more than that. I can put a legend associated with that to give a description of what this group of fields means. So I can go here and say legend general information and then put a legend on the second field set for academic information. general information, academic information. That can be useful, again, especially like with a billing and shipping address, because both the billing and shipping address might have city, state, and zip, right? By putting them in a field set, it's easy to see, well, that's the billing city, state, and zip. This is a shipping city, state, and zip. All right, now on to styling this form, all right? Now, we can style the form, and we can use a lot of the techniques that we've used before. All right. Um, what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to get rid of the bullet points, all right? Because the bullet points are kind of ugly and don't really add anything to the page. So I'm going to go, and again, for simplicity, I'm going to put my style inside this page, although you know that it's generally better to have an external style sheet. So I can go in and I can say, UL list style type none. So that's going to remove the bullet points. That looks better already. Now the one thing I don't like about this is that these things are kind of irregular. It would be nice if I could line these things up, all right? So I'm going to go in and conveniently each LI contains a label. So I'm going to say label with 300 pixels. And it doesn't do anything. Any idea why it doesn't do anything? I didn't typo. I should have told you in advance it wasn't going to do anything because I knew it wasn't going to do anything. This isn't just me covering up after I realized I made a mistake. All right. Label is what kind of tag? Inline or block? Inline, right? How do I know it's an inline? because I have a label and right next to it is the field. 
You can't set widths on an inline tag. So what I can do is I can say display inline block. Inline block is sort of like um, a combination of the two. It's still going to be an inline tag, but I can then set the attributes associated with a block tag. So, now when I do that, notice how everything is scooted over that way. Maybe a little bit too far over that way, so let's make it smaller. Let's make the width 200 pixels. Now, something I still don't like, there's a big space between student name and that, U.S. citizen and that, state and that. So what can I do? I can say text align, right. And that puts those things right up next to each other. Notice how I didn't even really do a lot here, all right? But I made the page look a lot, lot nicer. All right, made the form look a lot nicer, a lot more complete. I can put maybe a little bit of space there by saying, margin five pixels, we'll put a little bit of space between them. All right, that spaces it out a little bit. I could make these a little bit bigger. Field set, maybe give it a background color of a light gray. Maybe give it a border of two pixel solid. Make it a lighter gray, or darker gray rather. Might be a little bit too dark of a gray for the background, so I'll lighten it up a little bit. All right. If I want to put space between those, I can say give a field a set a margin. pixels and that puts a little gap in between them. All right, we can see how that looks a lot better than what we had before. Yes? Uh, what's the difference between an EM that you put up in a uh, container and a PC? Is it the same thing? A point on the PC for the size and the size? They both, they're, they're the same in that they both control the font size. The difference is, is that EM is relative. That's relative to the default size, where point is an absolute number. All right, it's, or, or yeah, like, like you could say, like if you go into Word, you can say you want eight point font. That's an absolute number. Whereas M says I want to make it twice as big as the default. So if the default gets bigger, then the M will make it bigger. So they're both used to specify the size of things, 
But M is preferred because, again, it's relative to the default size. And if the default size is bigger, it's going to make that bigger still. Okay, so with a little bit of effort, um, essentially I didn't do anything in the CSS that we haven't done before for other things. Um, so this part was just a little bit of an exercise just to show you that um, everything that we learned about CSS still applies here. All right? Of course it would, right? I mean, these are HTML tags like anything else. So whatever you want to do. You could use a background image for a form if you wanted to. If you had a pattern or something like that that you wanted to use that didn't get in the way, you could do that. I could make my text areas bigger. It's not a lot of space to put in someone's biography. So I could say text area height 300 pixels width 400 pixels and I will get a bigger text area. It might be too big, but you get the idea. All right. So, everything that I've showed you with forms now is HTML4 stuff. And it still applies. You can, you, you can use all the form tags that I use now for radio buttons, for drop downs, for text boxes, and so on. But with HTML5, there's some refinements, especially refinements to text boxes. So now there's like a bunch of different kinds of text boxes. In HTML4, a text box was a text box. You could type any characters you wanted to in there. Well, what if you wanted to make sure it was, it was a number? and not letters. Well, you had to write JavaScript to validate it. With HTML5, there are sort of specialty text boxes that limit to what you enter in to being just numbers or dates and so on. Now, there's a good news, bad news scenario for this. The bad news is not every browser supports all the HTML5 form tags. The good news is and this is a term that we used before, it degrades gracefully. What does that mean? It means if the browser doesn't support it, it doesn't break it, it just treats them like normal text boxes, which means that you're no worse off than you were before. So we're going to try this out. We're going to go to W3 schools to try out some of the HTML5 new form fields and see how they react um, on different browsers. So let's open Google Chrome because I know that HTML5 stuff works well with the version of Google Chrome that we have. So I'm going to go to W3Schools and I'm going to look under HTML5 Actually, I'm going to go about this a different approach. I'm going to go under HTML tutorial and look for forms. Actually, input types. Here's the password if you want to see how it works. Try it yourself. If you type in a password, it shows you nothing. All right, starting here shows you the HTML5 things. Several new input types. Color, date, date, time, email, month, number, range, search, telephone, time, URL, and week. These are all, if you want to think of them that way, just special versions of the text box that limit to what you can enter. So for example, let's do try it yourself. I put in a quantity between one and five. All right. 
I click submit, boom, I get a message. That happens without any kind of JavaScript because I said input type equals number, quantity equals one and five. Let's go and try this under our version of Internet Explorer. So I think we have an old version of Internet Explorer here. I actually hope we do. All right. So now I go in and type some garbage in here. I should get an error message, but I didn't. All right. What does that mean? That means that we would have to write JavaScript validation to take care of that. Which is what we had to do prior to HTML5 anyhow. So we're no worse off. So as HTML5 becomes more and more accepted, then these will become more popular. But you can use them now. Or you can actually write, and we won't, we won't talk about it in this class, you can actually write server-side validation to handle this. So that the, the server would look at this and say, hey, that's not a valid value. We'll notice that for each of these in Internet Explorer. For each of the HTML5 input types, Internet Explorer treats it just like a text box. So I could put anything into it and it will send it to the server and process it. Whereas on a newer browser, I have to enter in a month, day, year. So If I try to enter something in that's different, it actually won't let me enter in anything different, something that's not a date. And I can use the little <coughs> arrows to pick the date. So the bottom line for this is it's OK to use the HTML5 new form controls, all right? If you have something like a number or a date or a range or something like that, just know that if you use them, there's still a possibility that people have browsers that don't support those, to, those, those new features. So therefore, you're going to have to either write some JavaScript or some server-side code to handle if someone doesn't support those browsers and do, do some additional validation. Let's look at some more of the fields here. There's actually a color picker where I can pick, if I click on it, I can go and pick my favorite color from the range of possible colors. And it changes it to that. Other options are range, where the number I type in has to be between those numbers, so 0 and 10, or actually I have a slider control to pick between 0 and 10, so all the way over is a 10. Time, daytime, and so on, email, all right? So these you can use now, and people that have newer browsers that support HTML5 will get the benefit of those. People that don't, they'll simply be treated like text boxes, and you'll have to write some code to handle them, which, again, is not that bad of a situation. Now, how do you know what browsers support what? There's some nice tools online. Can I use is the one that I want to look at here. So I can look and say, can I use the HTML5 color input? 
So I click that, and even in the newer versions of Internet Explorer, it's not supported. So in Internet Explorer 8, 9, and 11, it's not being supported. In Edge, which is a newer version of Internet Explorer, in version 13 it's not supported, but in version 14 it is. Of course, according to this, 0% of the world uses that version of the browser, so that doesn't really gain you anything. Firefox, Chrome has better support. iOS, Safari does not have that support. Neither does the Android browser until this point, and Safari doesn't. So I could go and see, like, before I spend time using something, I can go and see what browsers support it and what don't. Um, number input type. That was supported starting in IE 11. Well, actually, it was partially supported. The darker green indicates that it's fully supported. In other words, it works exactly the way it's supposed to. The more olive green is like, well, it sort of works, but not completely. So this is a valuable tool to have if you're considering any HTML5 um, tags uh, to determine how well the browser supports them. All right, are there any questions? Thursday, we will start in talking about tables. We now have two topics, and we have sort of a third thing that's probably even bigger than the two other topics that we're talking about. We have tables, which will take a class or two to discuss. Then we have JavaScript. But probably more important to that than, than each of those is, is our projects. So please bring any questions you have about your projects to either class or lab. And I'll be happy to go over um, them with you. Uh, this is week 13. We have week 13, then 14 and 15, and then we're done and the project is due sometime during week 16. I will probably not stay the whole time in lab today. I have to, I have to make a, a short little trip. So um, I will, we can go to the lab. I'll probably stay there for a few minutes, see if anyone has any questions, and if no, no one has any questions, I'll probably leave a little bit early. Or a lot early, maybe. I don't know, we'll have to see. All right, any questions now? All right, we'll see you up in lab.